Hi, everyone. This is David Kincannon. I'm coming to you live from the west coast of Ireland, where I'm in a gale. So if you hear the wind, don't worry. We've got speakers from across nine time zones tonight. Uh, my colleagues, Charles Norchi and Kristen Larson, are here. We're in the second of three installments on the legal issues affecting exploration. And tonight, we thought we'd have a real fun one for you. Who owns the moon? Because we've got Richard Garriott, the club president, and Mariba Ja, who are terrific speakers. And the question often comes up now with private space exploration, and especially with the, the most recent flights from July until last week, what's going on out there? Who owns what? What are the legal issues affecting exploration of space? And uh, what's the situation now with private space exploration now that we are doing more than governments are? So let me give you a little bit of a primer, and then I'll throw some questions out to Charles and Kristen, and we'll go to Richard and then to more of Sorry. So sharing screen, PowerPoint, you or start show, give me a play from start. Uh, in the past, who owns the moon really came down to treaties and, and the, the number one treaty that governs the use of space exploration had always been the Outer Space Treaty. It's formally known as the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States Exploring the Use of Outer Space including the moon and celestial bodies. And it was adopted by the United Nations in October, 1967. That's important because nobody had been to the moon by October, 1967. And we were just in the midst of the space race uh, and the transition from, uh, we were into Gemini after Mercury and before Apollo. So now all of the space nations and all of the other nations had got together and developed a treaty about exploration of space, and it followed the Antarctic Treaty, which Kristen's gonna talk about. As of this year, 111 countries were parties to that treaty, including everyone that's actually been into space, and then another 23 signatories. And it developed out of the, the, uh, the Cold War with ICBM, Intercontinental, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles launching into space, then Sputnik, and then with all this anxiety about the militarization of space, we ended up with the Outer Space Treaty. And that is really the only treaty, international treaty that still applies today. And it just, it talks about things like the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit of all mankind. And just like the Antarctic Treaty, um, outer space shall be free to exploration and on and on and on, astronauts will be returned, et cetera. But it doesn't talk about really private exploration of space because there wasn't really any private exploration of space at that time, nor was it contemplated. And nor was it ever imagined that anybody but a government would have all of the money necessary to send a rocket to the moon or up into space. So, but, but that's kind of where things sat until basically, I'm running ahead here, but until the 1970s. And then the United Nations decided that, well, now the U.S. has explored the moon and Russia sent some probes there, but we ought to come about with another treaty. And they came up with the agreement governing activities of states on the, on the moon and other celestial bodies. It's another multilateral treaty that talks about jurisdiction for celestial bodies and orbit and, and essentially um, the orbital bodies. But the problem with the moon agreement is, sorry about that, can't advance. Uh, nobody cares. It's um, it, one of the provisions of the moon agreement was that no part of the moon shall become property of any state, international government, non-governmental organization, national organization, or any natural person, non-governmental entity, or any natural or person. That's everyone. And there shall be no right of ownership that will be created over the moon by placing personnel or equipment on it. This was a big omission in the Outer Space Treaty, but nobody cared. Um, there's only 18 states that are now parties to the treaty as of today in 2021. It's never been ratified by any state that engages in self-launched human spaceflight, China, Russia, United States, and it has absolutely no relevancy in international law, except I'm gonna mention it to you tonight. Uh, to fill the hole left by 
the Outer Space Treaty and the lack of adoption of the Moon Treaty, the United States in starting in 2015, but then in May of 2020 announced that it and a handful of countries had advanced cooperation of exploration of the moon with the first signings of something called the Artemis Accords. The provisions of the Artemis Accords are pretty much the same as the Outer Space Treaty, except it now applies and allows private ownership of items on the moon. Here are some of the principles of the Artemis Accord and we'll make these available to you. Peaceful exploration, transparency, interoperability, emergency assistance shall be provided, register space objects, and that's what we're gonna talk about later with space junk, um, preserving heritage. In other words, you can't go in and take souvenirs from the landing site of the Apollo missions and things of that nature. But the most important point about the Artemis treaties for our discussion tonight is that the, the accord, not the treaty, the accord, delineates safety zones or areas within which signatory nations can carry out certain activities that will benefit the US, private corporations and other developed spacefaring nations. It does not help developing nations. Uh, and it builds on something called the Space Act that was passed under the Obama administration in the US, which allows US citizens to engage in commercial exploration for a commercial recovery of space resources. In other words, you can mine the moon, you can own objects on the moon. And then President Trump signed an executive order reiterating that US citizens will have the right to engage in commercial exploration of outer space. And it explicitly states, the United States does not view outer space as global commons, repudiating the Outer Space Treaty. And the order specifically denounced the moon agreement and said, it's all for us. What's interesting about the Artemis Accords, again, it's not a treaty, but there were several countries that signed, Australia, Canada, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, the United Kingdom, and the US. But how many of these countries have actually been to the moon? And what exactly are they supporting? The countries that are notable for not signing it are China, Russia, and others, Germany, France, India, and the European Space Agency. So this accord will be enforced by contract. Anybody that participates in the Artemis program in the US, which is NASA's space launch system, the Orion spacecraft or the gateway outpost in lunar orbit that gets government money has to sign the Artemis Accords and agree to be bound by contract. And that is essentially everyone that has participated in private space exploration, SpaceX, Dynetics, Blue Origin, Boeing, all of these companies are there. And that now sets up a new legal regime by contract outside of the United Nations, where the companies that are actually doing the majority of space exploration today, all privately, are governing themselves by an agreement, a contract between themselves, and not in accordance with any international treaty. So that's my, my five minute spiel on that. And I'll throw it over to Charles Norchi. And Charles, will you tell us essentially, um, in this era of private space exploration, is public international space law still relevant? So what David has told you or pointed out is that we are at a critical juncture in the international law of outer space. The edifice that was being built for the 1950s, as David described, really started with customary international law. What are the two sources of public international law? The second one is treaties. But within customary international law, as early as 1958, it appeared as though a norm was evolving that indicated that all of outer space was a res communis, a common heritage of mankind, similar to what we see in the Law of the Sea Treaty. That, as David pointed out, has been repudiated by the executive agreement in the last administration that is now a public law, right? It indicates that space is not an open common interest, according to that particular executive agreement. But where David was building the edifice for us at that time, with all these treaties, this is this was the public order of space. Now, what has changed is the public order from the fifties to the sixties was about power and, to an extent, science. Moving forward. 
we have an additional stake, an additional value, and that's wealth maximization and commerce. And that's where the public order is now being met by the civic order. So international space lawyers that normally just thought about treaties and agreements now have to be aware and work with, with contracts, with business arrangements, with all kinds of transactions that are beyond the public order. So we have a combining of the civic order and the public order of space. Now, the, the OST, the Outer Space Treaty, still has relevancy. And I would suggest it still has relevancy to, to explorers. For example, states are liable. They have state responsibility, international responsibility for any activity of that state in outer space, including its citizens. So natural persons and juridical persons, corporations. So the state still has liability. So that is something that we still need to think about. Um, the United States, as David has indicated, has authorized private firms to commercialize and exploit in outer space. That's now public. It's a public law as of 2015. In the view of the United States government, that is very much in keeping with the Outer Space Treaty. So we have a space law challenge, and we really are at a turning point here that we will explore as we move through the evening tonight. And to me, the space law challenge is how does space law clarify, regulate, and accommodate power, science, and wealth in outer space? It's a new order, potentially. So some have suggested that as a model and in the global common interest, we might turn to the Antarctica Treaty of 1959. And that's a very interesting model. And there's no better person to address that than our fellow lawyer explorer, Kristen Larson. Hello, everyone. Am I on? Am I live? Yes, you are. Okay. okay. Um, well, I am thrilled to uh, uh, be here to listen to uh, these erudite uh, discussions on outer space. And while Antarctica is a little bit more earthbound, uh, it's true. There are a lot of uh, analogs between um, the so-called seventh continent and, you know, uh, what we would call off-earth off exploration. Um, you know, in particular, I mean, it's uh, for, for uh, as long as people have been exploring Antarctica, they've really considered it in many ways to be a window on outer space, um, not only because of the, the legal uh, framework, which I'll, you know, touch on, but, you know, just even like the search for biosignature and, and microbial life. Uh, Antarctica is so harsh um, that the, the, the tools to, to look for biosignatures in outer space have been tested and refined by, you know, exploring um, the, the reaches of Antarctica, which is, which is, I think, you know, completely fascinating. Um, atmospheric phenomena, uh, there's no better place than Antarctica to look at those. And in fact, the, the best window that we have into deep space um, that's earthbound is at the South Pole, where you basically have uh, geostationary, um, uh, high-powered high um, telescopes looking deep into space. So, so truly Antarctica is a window into outer space uh, from Earth. Um, and, and the legal framework, I think it's, it's a really interesting question as, as uh, both of my colleagues have pointed out. Um, in some ways, you could say that the Antarctic Treaty has some very strong um, similarities and par parallels to the Outer Space Treaty, OTS. But, but you know, it's also, uh, early on, the, the, the UN, the, the, the members of the UN back in the, the 50s, you know, during the, the Cold War, were, were really interested in, in kind of securing Antarctica as, you know, a, a heritage, common heritage of mankind kind of regime. That's what kind of uh, framework was sought by, especially by developing nations. And, you know, the, the, the wealthier nations, the ones that could afford to uh, establish a foothold on the continent soundly rejected that. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Antarctic Treaty like came into being in, in the course of a, you know, you know, uh, 
a phenomenally fast period of time, which, you know, treaties normally take a long time. And the Antarctic Treaty really was negotiated and, and established in, you know, like about two years. And I do think it's because there was this this sort of growing cry from the from the UN parties that were not members in the treaty to 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 um, you know kind of open it up and keep it open and uh, the the countries that had really put significant uh, time and energy and of course resources into Antarctica said no we're going to make it a club we're going to make it accessible but we're going to still control it which is a lot more similar to what's going on with the Artemis Accords so you could say that you know that the Antarctic Treaty provides kind of an interesting framework but but it's not strictly sort of law of the sea kind of evolving it's it's sort of like a cross between a, an international treaty and and more of this accords where kind of countries that don't that, that can't pay to play are kind of shut out from a lot of the uh, ability to influence what what is going to happen and and how how uh, access is going to be developed so I think those are some really uh, interesting uh, uh, aspects to to think about as we as we go forward and you know I, I do continue to think that there are aspects and and how we've how we've seen uh, nation states respond to the Antarctic Treaty. It's still intact, which, you know, uh, most prognosticators said there's no way it's going to last more than, you know, 20, 30 years and it's still going strong. Um, and, you know, we haven't really had the big challenge of resource extraction. And I think that that's going to really put a lot of pressure on the Antarctic Treaty uh, structures. And I think that uh, we are going to also see those same uh, pressures applied when we start moving into a, uh, ex extractive, um, sort of, um, regime in, in, uh, you know, off planet. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Kristen touched on something that's actually really interesting that when the law develops, it develops to, to, to suit current problems and thinking forward to where things should be thinking around corners as Jeff Bezos likes to say. The one thing that's different about Antarctica versus space and even the high seas is resources. And we're not extracting resources from Antarctica at the moment. And if we do, as, as Kristen said, the Antarctic Treaty will change, but we are looking at space to extract resources. And we are looking at the high seas as a place to extract resources. So the international law of the sea, the US has never signed it. And, and the, the high seas are still the wild west in some ways. And now space is becoming the new Wild West. And so that's something to think about. And I mean, now to, to, to get to, the, to the, the folks that have waded in with the sharks here, the lawyers, you know, I've known Richard Garriott for over 20 years. And I know a lot about what Richard's done. I know he's been up on the International Space Station. His father was into space. Richard and I did an expedition where we went diving 16,000 feet deep at the Bermuda Triangle. Richard's been to the Titanic. He's been to Antarctica. And he's also just recently made a dive to the deepest point on earth in the Marianas Trench. But two weeks ago, I learned something about Richard I didn't know. And I am stunned, but not surprised. And Richard Garriott, the president of the Explorers Club, will you please share with us what knocked me over with a feather? It's up to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, David, for that kind introduction. Uh, hi, Richard Garriott here. You're uh... Uh, recently elected uh, president of the club. And of course, just to cut straight to the chase, so the question of the day, who owns the moon? Uh, with only slightly tongue in cheek, I will say that I own the moon. And, uh, and, I, and I won't lay claim to the whole moon, uh, but I will lay claim uh, that I believe is a fairly uniquely supportable claim to at least part of the moon, and uh, and let me let me lay out that that case for you lawyers today, and and uh, we'll circle back uh, uh, later to to discuss that. So in 1996, uh, actually another space lawyer, a guy named Art Dula, uh, was in Russia during the collapse of the Soviet Union, Soviet Union, and convinced uh, the Lavashkin Institute that had put a rover on the moon uh, with the Soviet group, with the Soviet uh, 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 Empire. Uh, they had put two of these kind of tank-like rovers on the moon, Lunacod 1 and Lunacod 2, and they decided to sell off Lunacod 2. And in 1996, I purchased Lunacod 2 as an object that is still sitting on a foreign celestial body. And so it's the first time an object was sold that is not on the Earth. 
And, uh, uh, and so that, that on its own was already a, a bit novel. But as soon as I, I made that purchase, I began to, we began to then just think about and discuss what the legal ramifications of that were. For example, even the fundamentals of, you know, can I actually assert claim of that object since it's not physically on the earth? And, uh, and so I went to a space lawyer, a woman by the name of Pamela Meredith, and I had drafted uh, a legal document specifically to respond to these treaties and other, uh, well, like the Artemis Accords weren't, a, weren't around yet, but all the other things you all have just enumerated uh, to figure out, you know, what could I assert? Uh, and, and again, going back to some of the things like even the law of the seas, uh, you know, to, to, to make that, you know, if, you, know, if, you, uh, if you throw a uh, life preserver off of a cruise ship and it washes up on a desert island, you know, nobody would, have, no one would claim that uh, they could, uh, no one would have support your assertion uh, that you own the, uh, the shores of the, the island that it washed up on. However, this Lunacod, which I do own, uh, actually is still in use, even though the the, uh, the batteries on it have since failed. Uh, right up here on the front is a set of, of uh, three-dimensional reflective mirrors that is still used to this day by a variety of uh, telescopes around the world that bounce lasers off of it. And there's only about three such sources on the moon that are used to detect Earth-Moon distance and some wobble of the moon. So this is far from space junk. It is still in active use. And it, uh, uh, I don't think anybody would debate that it belongs to me. Now, the next question is, is just like the United Nations, for example, recognizes even just mathematically describable spots in space, right? We were talking about, uh, Kristen was mentioning geosynchronous satellite locations. The, the standard is that if you're the first one there and you're controlling it, it is effectively owned. You might not use the word ownership, it is under your control. As long as your satellite is operational and stable in that slot. However, if you lose control of it, it fails, if it drifts out, then it goes back to you know, public property at that point. But my rover is still in use. It's still where it was sold, uh, where, where it was sent. And so uh, from that, we, we, we went from just owning the object to making an assertion that I can own the dirt that my rover is sitting on, or at least I'm controlling it, it's still in use. I control this dirt under my, the lander and the rover, the two pieces that are, that are there on the moon. Then one step down from that, you can go, well, okay, you know, again, going back to the desert island analogy, uh, you know, if I put a flag on the corner of a desert island in the middle of the Pacific, you know, no one's going to let me claim the whole island. But if I farm a little chunk of it and put up a fence around it, uh, most people would acknowledge that that area that I have modified uh, is now under, you know, my purview. Well, in this case, my rover has traveled 40 kilometers across the surface of the moon left trackways that it is tilled with its wheels uh, that are still visible from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. I have very nice photographs of them, both historical and modern. Uh, and so it's reasonable to then make another assertion that I own that 40 kilometer trackway. And then the final and more, the, again, these are becoming more and more difficult to defend, but the, 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 uh, the final assertion can be that this vehicle also had a wide, a, a large number, about six or eight cameras on it uh, the highest cameras were about six feet in altitude, and they photographically surveyed all the land that is visible from that 40 kilometer trackway from an altitude of six feet. And I have all that data also. And so it uh, could be reasonable for me to claim not just the 40 kilometer trackway, but everything that this vehicle has surveyed. Uh, and so that's actually the claim that I, that I have documented and I'm, you know, have, uh, uh, there's really no place to file it at this stage, but I, I have shared it freely. Most of you now have had uh, copies of this sent to you. Uh, and, uh, uh, and just as a, a point of interest, uh, I've also been involved with the X Prize since uh, in its early days. And uh, some of you may remember there was recently a Google Lunar X Prize that included a, you know, a $25 million prize, I believe it was, for the first private vehicle to go rove on the moon. And there was going to be a $1 million bonus for accuracy of landing. And so the XPRIZE said, hey, why don't you go land near a previously existing lunar site? To which immediately the NASA reaction and the United States reaction was, please do not land near any of our sites because we want to preserve them for heritage. And then Russia chimed in and said, please do not land near any of our sites either. And that leaves, of course, only one site, which is my site. And so we uh, had an informal agreement. It never went to paper because the, uh, the time limit ran out on the Google funding of that prize. 
but uh, we, we were planning to set it up to where if one of these uh, these uh, private rovers made it to the moon, accurately landing near our site, that we would then have economic exchange where I would say, hey, I'll pay you handsomely for any data or photographs of any of my my rover, my lander, my trackways, my property. Uh, but by the way, I also hope that you will pay me access rights to be on my property, and therefore we will have exchanged economic interests uh, and be and help sort of lay the groundwork to answer some of the questions you're you're currently answering. So anyway, that's that is uh, you know sort of the summary of my claim. I think it goes from strong claim to you know to more tenuous as you go down that stack. But in contrast to you know like the um, lunar embassy folks who like use a telescope and say we're going to sell plots of the moon that we can just see but otherwise have no claim towards. Uh, or uh, uh, in contrast to, you know, geosynchronous satellite uh, locations, uh, you know, I think this is a, a reasonably solid basis for uh, an initial run at uh, ownership or at least control of uh, property off of planet Earth. Fantastic. You, that was... Richard, uh, Richard. Uh, yeah, Charles, go ahead. Is 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 your rover mobile on those tracks? I thought it when you first acquired it, it was. Is it? No, the the rover. Uh, the, the reason it's uh, stopped, it's no longer moving. Okay. Uh, it hasn't for many many years. Uh, is uh, it appears that enough uh, lunar dust covered the solar panels to prevent the batteries from recharging uh, appropriately. You know, at this point, the radiation may have also uh, done it in, even if you were to go up there with a broom and dust it off, uh, much less any any systems on the ground that have the proper telemetry to drive it, because it was it was actually driven in with a real time linkage, uh, you know, like a toy tank, uh, you know, in, with real time input, no AI. This is way before the days of AI, but the mirrors and other systems are still in use. Uh, there are still uh, radioactive isotopes for temperature control that are probably still providing some warming, uh, but no, it is not mobile on the surface at this point. So at least, late, at least lately, your customary international law argument would be that this is terra nullius, that you have an object, so land owned but by no one. But, until it's, a, your but object it's, a, it's an object, but it's an object still in use. Like, for example, it, you can, uh, the argument that I would make is just like a geosynchronous satellite, which because right. of the fact that it's not on land needs periodic active control until it runs out of fuel to stay in that position. And you can imagine in the future, instead of using fuel, we might have uh, some uh, magnetic uh, ways to adjust your orbit to, to maintain position. In my case, it's sitting on the lunar surface. So it doesn't need any fuel or other active maintenance of its position. But just like a geosynchronous satellite might be used for radio signal uh, re, you know, bouncing, a rebroadcast, receiving and resending, my mirrors are receiving signals from the Earth and returning them to their source. And so uh, for very accurate scientific measurements that are done literally to this day, most, most days my mirrors on my rovers are used. And so I would still say it's in active use. So to recap what I was about to say, or was, was saying, your module is essentially evidence of an ongoing effectivity or um, evidence of continuing control on land that was once terra nullius. Exactly. And hence occupation would translate into title and property under international law. At That's least customary exactly international law. That's, That's your exactly argument. Exactly right. As always, the most interesting man in the Explorers Club knocks me off my feet. Um, thank you for that, Richard. That's really cool. Um, our next speaker, I, 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 I'm going to apologize in advance for, for, for massacring your name, and I want you to correct me immediately, but it's Mora Bajaa, correct? Oh, yeah, my brother. Excellent. Well, I've seen you talk before, and I just was also blown away by by the information that you have to impart upon us. So I'm not going to do anything else, but just say, have at it, please. Look, You're down I, I think, in Austin, Texas. That's all I can say. That's right. That's right. I'm in Austin, Texas, you know, hook, hook them horns, that sort of thing. Uh, Richard is also an Austinite, even though he's not currently uh, physically present here at the moment, but still uh, a neighbor. I think this is awesome. It's a great uh, topic of conversation. I love 
when we can have these sorts of tug of war discussions and get people to think about this stuff because you look, we're, we, we're doing a lot of things and we're not necessarily thinking of all the uh, unintended consequences uh, of our actions in space. I'm going to put out, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to put out a challenge. Uh, it, not that Elon, Jeff, uh, or Sir Richard Branson are listening to this, but here's my challenge. I'm not going to ask Richard for permission to go to his site. And I'm going to challenge any of the world's richest people to send me there, send me to his site so I can touch down without his permission and see if he can sue me and like get some money out of it. There's my challenge. <laughs> Look, I can tell you, I've talked to you know all my students and even my family can attest to this. I'm not big into feeling this whole like free fall environment kind of thing. Like if somebody were to say, do you want to feel the free fall of space or spend the week at the shores of Lake Como in Italy? It's going to be Lake Como six ways till Sunday. But in this case, given what Richard just said, I'm going to put the challenge out there for people that have the resources. I am putting myself out there. Send me to his site. I'm going to trespass based on what Richard just said. He's going to raise this issue. And will he be able to litigate this and actually win? Does he have a legal basis and premise to basically, you know, file suit against me for trespassing against where his rover has been? I'd love to see that whole thing play out. Okay. So with that said, um, I'm really looking at space traffic, the things that uh, Richard brought up and, and what everybody has been discussing in terms of legal issues with owning things. I loved the whole, um, you know, talking about the Outer Space Treaty. I'll say this. I'm going to, picture is worth uh, a thousand words, as they say. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll see if we can, you know, as always, this stuff works out. So let me, let me see if, uh, can people kind of see See all these dots? Okay. So, you know, here at UT, we've developed this thing called Astrograph. Basically, it's a crowdsourced uh, logo sphere of stuff in space. Everybody's opinion is kind of reflected here. So you can kind of see things uh, in Earth orbit. And uh, while you see a lot of dots, the dots are not to scale. This is like a so what? Okay. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you so what. So let, let's go to this view. So here's, here's 4,000 of those objects in Cartesian space, Euclidean space. This is snapshot in time, 4,000 of these objects. And you can kind of see the geostationary ring. We, 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 we talked about that a little bit earlier. Here's things in low Earth orbit. The color coding, the color coding is based on the inclination, how inclined is the orbital plane with respect to the Earth's equator. So by that, that, by that measure, Things that are near zero inclination are things that are kind of orbiting an Earth's equatorial plane. And things that are like 90 degrees inclination are things that are orbiting around the poles, right? The Arctic and Antarctic. Now, this might not say lots to you in terms of like highways and stuff in space, but look, nobody has deeds for stuff in Earth orbit. However, comma, I'm going to get nerdy here. So forgive me. I'm, you know, faculty here, aerospace engineering. I have to throw in a few like cross products and that sort of stuff. So look, if I take the position vector crossed with a velocity vector, R cross V, I get H, which is specific orbital angular momentum. Basically for those 4,000 objects, this specific orbital angular momentum is mapped here on the right-hand side. I haven't done anything except take a vector cross product. The interesting thing is you can actually see some highways here, okay? In this in this angular momentum space. Now the magnitude of this orbital angular momentum is based on orbital energy, which says that the geo stuff is here on the top. This halo on top, those are all like geo objects. The stuff in the middle is uh, basically like geo transfer type stuff. Everything here on the bottom is low Earth orbit stuff, and you can see how this naturally segregates in terms of the inclination, which is beautiful. I haven't done any magic, no hand waving, no Jedi mind tricks. This is just R cross V. The cool thing, right, is that you can see orbital highways here. And I can tell you that 
uh, it's a first come, first served sort of thing. Meaning, at this point, and let, let's go to this thing right here. We call this the conjunction streaming service. Meaning, out of about 19,825 objects in the public catalog from uh, 18th Space Control Squadron, U.S. Space Command, we're asking ourselves a question, which pair of those objects is predicted to come within 10 kilometers uh, for you that, that, that loves the, 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 the queen's rule, you know, six miles kind of thing within the next 20 minutes. Uh, the, green, the green dots are pairs of things that are both working. Red dots are things where both are dead. And yellow, one thing's working, one thing is dead. The interesting thing is that you can kind of see this spike around 800, 900 kilometers. There's a little blip here around 500. This blip is Elon, okay? Elon Musk pretty much without any deeds owns the 500 kilometer orbital altitude. So anybody wanting to go through 500 kilometers, kind of, you know, if you want to do the prudent thing, you kind of want to coordinate with Elon. Is that cool? What do you feel about that? I mean, he doesn't actually have orbital real estate, but as physics says, you know, when, when two objects try to occupy the same space at the same time, bad things happen. So you, you want to prevent that sort of stuff, right? So, you know, case in point, when you have a physical presence, whether it's in space, on another celestial body, like Richard's uh, right rover, which is still, by all means, it is not debris. It is still serving a purpose. In fact, a scientific purpose at that, right? What do we do? Is that cool? How do people feel about that? Do we need to ask Elon to go through this stuff? What does that mean? Are you going to send me to uh, Richard's uh, rover to see if he can sue me and, and, and win in court? So, you know, these are very interesting questions. We talked about even the space object registry. Look, even space law, international law in terms of treaties, Many countries have signed, ratified these things. Does it mean the same to everybody? Aha, maybe not so much. I tell my students, if you want to know something, you have to measure it. And in fact, one of the things that we did was we decided, let me, let me, let me, let me look, look at this thing first. We decided to look at how space objects are interpreting the UN Space Object Registration Treaty, which says... Register your object as soon as is practicable. As soon as is practicable. Okay. This is, by the way, this is not a labeled access. So I'm going to tell you what the ordinate access is. It's days since launch. Okay. Days since launch. The last time I checked, oh, somewhere around 365 days, like a year, we can see countries that register their objects years after the thing's been on orbit. And it's the same treaty. They signed the same thing. They agreed to the same words. Do we see standard behavior in registration? No. So even with the Outer Space Treaty, even with the words there that nobody owns this, that, or the other, we all interpret things differently. So you know what? I've kind of said a lot. I'm going to leave it there, and I'm just going to scale back and just... Have some popcorn and see what happens next. Well, we, we have a question that's just come over the transom. If I can lob it at you, uh, more of a, which, which, uh, which, which, which is this. You're very effective in tracking all of the objects. Very, very effective. What activities in space are being obstructed potentially by the existence of all of these objects? That, that, that question came through the chat. I love that. So here's the thing, right? People, when, when, when people ask that question, I know that there's a group of folks that want to hear about the threats and the nefarious and the malicious stuff. I don't want to play into that because I don't necessarily believe that all of humanity is about one-upping each other and being greedy. I'll put it this way. There are some unintentional consequences. Look, if I have some earth observing satellites and I want to take pictures of the earth to, I don't know, climate change, disaster relief, hydrology. Um, 
if I see that I'm going to collide with somebody else, one of us has got to move. That's going to affect my data collection. So there's like a real impediment to science in being able to figure out how do we phase this growing number of satellites, even if for no other purpose to collect science that's going to actually help humanity extend its expiration date on the planet. And, and you rightly, uh, and, and, and Richard's got one in a second, but, but just to follow up on this, uh, you rightly identify the Space Object Registration Treaty and what we have is a compliance problem. And how we fix that, I'll toss out to the uh, my fellow lawyers, but Richard had a question. Oh, well, well yeah. first, more about, I got to say, I, I need to come down and take one of your courses. I, I think it would be just uh, so much fun to sit with you in a classroom and go over this stuff, seriously. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, 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 but I want to even circle back on your, your, uh, your challenge to get you taken up to the moon, by the way, I think it was a great way to get a free trip to the moon. So the, you know, so bravo for the first part of that. Uh, and, uh, my crewmate on my trip to the international space station, Mike Fink is on the call with us uh, here today too. And, uh, he, he was posing a, a question about squatters rights, uh, but I'm going to loop it back into what you were saying about trespassing on my property. Which is, I think that if you went up there and like move, changed the mirrors in some way that actually destroyed its function, that I probably could successfully sue you in court. Um, I, you know, would be my guess. On the other hand, if you became a squatter on my property, property, I actually think I couldn't unless I had any practical way to remove you from my property. So whoever it is that gave you that ride, I need them to give me a ride up there too, so I can get out the broom and you know tell you to scooch off my porch. And uh, 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 but without that, if I if I don't have the ability to chase you off, then I actually think that you could begin to make then you could begin to say that my control of my orbital area on the moon was lax and therefore you were reclaiming it yourself. And so uh, but but these I think these are the interesting questions. But uh, but 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 I think one of the most interesting ones you posed was about launching through the 50 or 500 kilometer uh, you know, uh, suite. We know, you know, lots of people have already been screaming about the poten potential uh, interference from telescopes looking up or launches going up. Um, and as you've noted, we have uh, uh, little visibility, much less uh, uh, international agreement as to what to do about that. Yeah, no, I, I think that those are good points. Um, I just want to reiterate the challenge. It sounds like the challenge is really somebody sending both of us together. I won't say no. I won't say no, we'll be friends until we get there and then you can bring out the broom. I'd love to see that. That's got to be like one of the best documentary photo shoots ever will be you like sweeping me off your, your property. So let's plan on that. Let's see who takes us on that. But look, in terms of like the you know astronomy community and the light pollution, I just don't think that people really understand uh, what the impact of uh, having more and more satellites on orbit is to astronomy. And so, so what I'm going to do, you know, while we still talk is I'm going to, I'm going to start looking for, um, I actually have a video that my research associate, Dr. Daniel Kacharsky put together in terms of being able to figure out like what this light pollution stuff looks like. And I think just people just don't, they can't get calibrated on, on what this is like the struggle that actual astronomers have to deal with uh, on a nightly basis to get rid of this stuff. So, so as is, I'm going to start looking for this, but uh, let's keep the dialogue going. I'll let you know once I find find the dot mov, and then I can show it here in, in a screen share. So we have a follow up to the squatters um, problem, Richard. Potentially your problem. So squatters' rights. Whose property law applies? US. Yours as an American citizen someone else's what's what's Very the jurisdictional question. solution and maybe david you know, or and, kristen well, have an answer well in fact i want to point out something else too that uh ann um, had ann passer who uh helped put this together for us tonight thank you ann um had sent me a note on the side uh you know for people who think this is all uh, hypothetical and even though i mentioned my claim and i as i said slightly tongue-in-cheek but i actually think it, it brings up serious issues but but these issues are happening faster than people might realize. I mean, if you, uh, uh, for example, just this year, and if you just think about Explorers Club members, so uh, uh, on the uh, Crew 2 
uh, flight that went up uh, earlier this year. One of those uh, members was an Explorers Club uh, uh, member. Uh, then uh, when Richard Branson launched, he's an Explorers Club member. Uh, when uh, Blue Origin launched, uh, Jeff and Mark were Explorers Club members. When the Inspiration4 launch launched, all four of them were Explorers Club members. Uh, when the Axiom, that's, that's the last quarter. Going forward, actually the majority of launches into, of human launches into space are planned now to be private, not government astronauts, but private astronauts. Uh, you know, even uh, Russia just sent to the private film crew up to do private work. So this is, whether it's satellites, whether it's rovers, uh, you know, the Google and Rex Prize, these things, or whether it's, uh, 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 you know, uh, commercial or civilian astronauts, this is all now uh, uh, happening very, very quickly and uh, is something we're really going to have to deal with. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Let me <laughs> jump in, guys. Go ahead. You raise, for the law students out there, and I get, I get emails and, and, and uh, inquiries from law students all the time, what should I do if I'm interested in space law? I personally think that this question of collisions in space between private satellites is going to be a, 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 the full employment act for young lawyers because the, we have thousands upon thousands of objects up there. As you said, two things are going to collide if they get into the same space and they cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Somebody's going to want you know, to be compensated for those damages. Even if there's an insurance company, I work for insurance companies and they're going to sue to get back their money. So questions about jurisdiction, I actually think the U.S. jurisdiction applies if you fl fly out of the U.S. and national. Those are, those are interesting questions that are being shaped now. And it's not going to be very long before we have a lawsuit over damage that was done from this person's satellite to this person's satellite or this. And hopefully it doesn't cause any fatalities with manned space exploration or human space exploration. But it's it's on the horizon and it's within view. So, well, one thing that I can say, David, is this. Anybody on the planet right now, if you wanted to know who's liable, if there was damage that happened. Who's liable in, in the face of international law for any sort of damage on orbit? There's no place to look that up. Zero. There's no place to look that up. In fact, I've talked to governments, which, as all of you know, right, are, are the ones that bear that liability. There is no registry or database that lists all the launching states associated with every single object that we track. That doesn't right. exist, which I'm actually working on right now with my students. So that's... That's a salient issue, right? Especially where joint liability happens, right? Planet Labs has a satellite. They're an American company, uh, but they happen to launch with India's PSLV. Now, India and the United States are jointly liable for any damage that that one satellite, uh, right, uh, causes. How does that get, yeah, how does that get quantified, uh, prosecuted? I think, I think that is uh, a Pandora's box for sure. Well, and, and it'll be tested because the first time somebody has to pay for damages caused by someone else, they're going to want to get repaid. And it's not going to, we see it with ships at sea. We see it with, with other places and, and that. I promise you there will be a lawsuit in federal court in the United States from one party who was injured against another party who they think did it. And how, how do you prove it? As you said, half the... Yeah, lots of things in space. We don't know where they're from and we do, when they got there and what they're, what orbit they're in. A lot of things are lost. A lot of things are, are not being, uh, they're broken and, and there's a lot of debris to, to run into up Absolutely. there. And David, those are just, those are private parties. If we have a they government are. involved, then we've got a sovereign immunity threshold. Right. As far as exactly. quite are. Can't sue. India in a federal court in the United States because they have sovereign immunity. Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act applies. And all of these shipwreck cases would would take you there. You can't sue Spain to get possession of a Spanish galleon or to get a salvage claim against the Spanish galleon. They've had a string of successes. So you might be out of luck. Or but if it was Elon, you know, but but how do you know? So that's that's going to be an interesting thing. And also if you plan that flight and you didn't take into account what you might hit, you're an easy target. You bet. One, one other way to skin a cat. 
I mean, one of the things that I love that you just brought up, right, is is making these analogies with maritime, which I think is awesome. One of the things that I have uh, my own students looking at is to what extent can we apply uh, perhaps maritime salvage laws to stuff in space? Clearly, uh, there's no such thing as non-consensual debris removal. So, 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 so if I'm like, uh, you know, I don't know, some company in the United States, Jaw Sat LLC in the United States, I can't just go to like Das Vidanya LLC and just like remove their stuff without asking for permission. So how might we get around those sorts of things? I contend that, uh, you know, contractual salvage laws from maritime apply as long as it's within uh, launching states where there's joint liability. But there are a number of things on orbit that we have no clue who they belong to. It's just debris, right? It's just unrecognized. I mean, we can track the things, but we just don't know where they came from. Maybe we could apply just, you know, standard uh, salvage uh, laws from maritime and say, hey, if you clean this stuff up and you can demonstrate that you were successful and you can actually quantify that you've like provided, you know, carrying capacity back to this orbit, Maybe you should get, uh, you know, remunerated in, in, in one way or another. I think it would apply. I, I, I know I could make the argument. Uh, by the way, I, 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 I do want to pull one thing out of the feed that I see going by, too. Uh, somebody from over from Bradford Space is noting that some of these questions actually are being litigated right now, uh, specifically, and, and have been for years, they say, uh, at, it's specifically associated when a satellite manufacturer has made an error in design or fabrication that has therefore caused some problems. And so uh, uh, without more context, without them on the line, I don't know if they're referring to things that are completely domestic, so they uh, have some uh, legal ability to wrangle or not. Uh, but yeah, but these are these are the things that are coming up. Yeah, I would, I would think that would be a satellite being launched by say, Hughes aircraft that doesn't make it into orbit and doesn't do what it's, you said it was gonna do when I paid you to build it. And that would be that those those I can see that being litigated for years and the collisions that's just around the corner. So there were you know, some other great questions. Well, there's also one thing that people didn't say uh, there, there's uh, um, uh, Cynthia Johnson asks about liability issues related to environmental damage. And I want to I want to get there via this following example. I've been an investor in uh, space mining because I happen to believe that that is uh, uh, go ultimately going to be essential. Uh, and also incredibly valuable. And it's interesting to notice, uh, I don't know if uh, more about on your, um, uh, well, you're tracking artificial debris more than asteroids probably, or maybe both. But, uh, uh, but you know, uh, uh, I'm a believer in the theory, just like with meteorites that come all the way down to the earth, that, uh, that it's very likely there are some asteroids that are predominantly made out of incredibly valuable materials. And so, you know, step one, go out there and put a little pinger on the asteroid as a claim, you know, a little beeper that says this one's mine, then go tug it back over, you know, closer to the earth. And then, uh, you know, if you find a refrigerator chunk of refrigerator sized chunk of platinum, push that out of orbit, let it land in a desert somewhere and then go pick up the, you know, baseball sized piece of platinum that made it to the ground and ta-da, you're extremely wealthy. Um, but of course, doing, doing that, means uh, not only am I taking pretty heavy objects and taking them from deep space and bringing them close to the earth, which is probably going to scare some people, but then pushing chunks of it back onto the earth is going to scare a lot more people. And of course, there's a pretty darn, you know, pretty reasonable argument to be made for what about the environmental damage when it lands on someone's house or in, uh, or worse, uh, you know, make some other kind of environmental impact. So uh, what do you guys think of that? How bad is that going to get? Well, well, potentially very bad, but there's an interesting corollary out of the law of the sea with respect to deep seabed mining. And the last case that, come out of, that came out of the International Tribunal of Law, the Sea Advisory Opinion, actually is about liability for deep seabed mining, that a poor country that enters into a concession agreement, a contract with a private corporation might find itself faced with. But, on, on, but, but back to, to her question on uh, potential environmental damage, that's where I would see the state responsibility or, or the international responsibility provision of the OSC, the Outer Space Treaty, which pins that on a government, on behalf of government action plus private citizen action of that government would come into play. David, what do you think? I think so too. I, you know, it's, it's interesting that currently if you have a ship at sea and you, you 
lose oil and you create an oil slick, you're responsible for the damage. So if you launch a rocket into outer space, it doesn't make it and it comes back down and causes environmental damage. There, it would not be a stretch to hold that company responsible, that person, that state, doesn't matter, responsible for that environmental damage. It's different. You can't actually bring a government. You can't sue a government. Uh, there was a question about can Elon sue if, if somebody in India hits one of his satellites in the United States? The answer is no. You can go to India and try, but you can't do it here in the U.S. or I'm in Ireland, but you can't do it here either. Um, so there's a the law has not evolved to this point yet. The law is is behind the curve and it will be for some time when I led the operation to recover the Apollo rocket engines for Jeff Bezos. First question Jeff asked me was, is it possible? And he didn't mean operationally, logistically, he meant legally. And then later on, NASA threatened to prosecute us for about four hours. Um, and that didn't, that didn't go very well for them. And, but it's, it's just one of those things that it's going to happen. Somebody's going to set a precedent. Somebody's going to, try somebody's going to want to enforce it and there will be lawyers getting paid money to solve these problems and and uh resolve these claims but there will be more questions than answers for a very long time uh, the more we get up there the pull more a question to dave dolan another one of our senior club uh, uh members uh slash leaders uh, was just asking a, a very specific question I haven't know the answer to with about space junk cladding with the International Space Station. Uh, and uh, Mike Fink obviously knows this one well too, who's on the call with us, which is, uh, you know, the I was on the station maybe 20 years after the first modules were put up. So I saw some very new modules and some very old modules. And all the modules have, you know, w windows in them to look out in the space or back at the beautiful earth. And it's interesting that you can tell how old a module is based on how many pock marks the windows have. And so they get a couple of impacts per year per window, uh, was probably maybe approximately correct. Uh, and those look like, you know, you might imagine a rock that hits your windshield in a car when, uh, except these are something, these are things the size of a flake of paint um, tr impacting at uh, sometimes you know twice orbital velocity, so you know th something like something on the order of thirty thousand miles an hour. So we're talking about just an enormous uh, velocity. Uh, and by the way, that's much too small to be tracked. And so you know we can only track things down. I don't know what you're what you're doing more of, but you know the, to my knowledge, we can get down to about you know half the size of the head of a nut. And uh, uh, and the the stuff that is damaging the space station is much 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 smaller than that. And, uh, and I've heard uh, numbers like, you know, something about the size of a P, which is about the minimum you can track, would really just go through the space station and or uh, destroy a satellite and or uh, kill a person who was on a spacewalk. And so and there's a lot, of, a lot of things in that window. So, there, so this is a real hazard. It's, again, not a question of, you know, if one of these things, one of these catastrophic events will happen. It's, it's really a question of when. I mean, we're, it's all a probabilities game that uh, is getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 everything that you said is absolutely true. And um, it's pretty scary. But one of the things that I wanted to, to see if people were keen to, to see is the whole impact to astronomy with what the light pollution is real quick, if people were okay with that. Is that okay, David? And Nope. I live in a dark sky preserve. I like to see the stars and I don't like to see the satellites obscuring my view of the stars. Sure. Do, you, do, you have right. a, do you have a slide there? Yeah. So let me, yeah. let me show you. So hopefully you can see this. So what you're going to see is this, right? Here's uh, this is what astronomers or, or what some of astronomers care about. These kind of areas of the sky, Messier objects. Um, what you're going to see here, each streak is due to an anthropogenic space object, human made, human derived. Uh, it's in visual magnitude. That's the color. So humans can see down to about six large, larger numbers are dimmer objects, but clearly telescopes, which are light buckets can see pretty dim. So this is going to be as if you were standing at the site looking directly up the northwest, southeast. This is a celestial sphere around the Earth in the direction of the telescope. This is the moon and the sun. And then this is what the telescope can see. So everything that's gray is below the horizon. So, so this is what the telescope can see, a celestial sphere around the telescope. And uh, we're going to start at dusk. And all the streaks are clutter. This is what astronomers don't want to see in their field of view. And this is the current 
based on the current trackable set of objects. So it's not going to get any better because we keep on launching stuff, right? So, so this is what astronomers don't want to see. Clearly at, at dusk, you see a lot of stuff reflecting sunlight. As we go into closer to midnight, uh, these objects, many of them are going through Earth's shadow, so they get eclipsed, so they're not reflecting sunlight towards the observer, but you can see things in higher altitudes. And then you're going to see that as we get to dawn, that, that, that clutter is going to start to increase. So basically what we're telling astronomers is, look, collect all your data at local midnight. Uh, that's your best bet. And if you want to collect data aside from that, then you got to have a fi find a way to get algorithms to deal with the clutter of stuff that humans are responsible for reflecting energy, photons, visible light, or even in other wavelengths, right, towards your very sensitive cameras. And, you know, some people are like, oh, well, just tell astronomers to, to build more Hubble telescopes, right? Just put more of the telescopes on orbit, forget about ground-based systems. But, uh, you know, when I talk to the astronomy community, it turns out that ground-based systems can often serve as tip and cue sensors for the on-orbit stuff. So you actually can't just do it with the space-based stuff. You kind of need the ground-based stuff. And as you can see here, uh, there's a significant amount of clutter and see, now we're, going, we're getting towards dawn. Uh, there's a significant amount of clutter that uh, you know, astronomers have to contend with right now based on the currently tracked objects. And that's not to say you know, all, all the couple thousands or even tens of thousands that people want to launch for a variety of reasons. So I'm not saying that the number of objects is necessarily detrimental, but we got we to gotta do something, right? I mean, it's, it's not just about things colliding. Space traffic management is also about the impact to uh, science. So, wow. Of course, you know it's also not clear what the alternatives are exactly. You know, in the sense of this space stuff, a lot of it's pretty critical too. So, it's a it's a it's a vexing problem, as a lot of these are. So, a question: Is this problem the, at least the solution susceptible to some kind of public-private partnership? In your view, what about? I mean, is that is that I, has to happen here? So, Yes. So I would say unequivocally, yes. Government alone, uh, that's not going to help. <laughs> Commercial alone, that's not going to do it. I love public-private partnerships. I think that makes a lot of sense and both have stake in it, right? Skin in the game. So I think that's the best way forward, actually. Um, Marva, have you um, done that same mapping from the South Pole? Because I know that that was one of the primary arguments for putting high high um, in intensity um, telescopes at the South Pole, basically because they can focus on something for the whole of the, the polar night. And so they can sift out a lot of that noise and, you know, look deeper. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, it's maybe not exactly on topic, but but um, no, 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 no. Look, I love it because I haven't done it for the South Pole. I'm going to talk as soon as we're done with this, I'm going to talk to my research associate. I'm like, dude, hook us up for something on the South Pole. And I'm going to see what that is because I love, love doing analysis. And then uh, we'll see what that looks like. Yeah, no, I think it would be really cool. Uh, I, I actually wanted to, to ask Charles, um, you know, a little bit more about this, this squatters rights um, um, question, which really goes to who, who owns the moon. Um, you know, if you, if you think about the Antarctic... Um, analogy, uh, you know, Greenpeace and various other non-governmental entities will set up camp for a number of years <clears throat> in the Antarctic to either agitate or be watchdogs or to <clears throat> do, have some exploration uh, objectives. But, you know, that certainly does not just bestow ownership on them. Um, you know, they're tolerated. Um, and if they start doing, you know, uh, damage or interfering with the, uh, uh, you know, the state objectives um, in in that particular part of Antarctica, they, you know, they, they get escorted away and uh, they really don't have a ton of rights. Um, so I'm just wondering what you think in terms of that, that sort of analogy versus like um, <clears throat> Richard's sort of, you know, concept that, you know, where his object is on the moon, if that somehow, you know, um, is, is a different regime is applied. Your example in Antarctica, that's the persistent objector kind of mode. 
right? Yeah. Where you have that, a persistent objector might be able to thwart the evolution of customary international law, maybe international law. And so then the question is, with Richard's presence on what was previously terra nullius, now instrumentally occupied through what in international law we call effectivity, so a display of authority and control by virtue of his of, of his uh, rover, does that convey property rights? And what jurisdiction is the moon? And but, is but the if, jurisdiction we're talking about really governed by customary international law, the common heritage idea, and ultimately the outer space treaty? But, and but here's what question. I find interesting and about- then, and, and whose property law is gonna apply? And that's a David question, sorry, Richard. No, no, apart, my apologies, but you know, uh, the reason why I like Kristen's analogy of using Antarctica is that part of the agreements in Antarctica are to just agree to disagree, right? I mean, there are overlapping claims right. that are just unresolved. Which are frozen, and- the claims were frozen, metaphor. Frozen, yeah, literally but, and but figuratively. Yeah. Like the claim yeah, so what's interesting about that is, place. for example, uh, uh, I think David is also friends with the, with uh, some of us, uh, some of our business partners have, you know, a base in Patriot Hills in the middle of Antarctica. Yep. And, uh, and, and so uh, since I've been in business with that guy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim that's mine for the purposes of this thought experiment where Morib is going to come squat on this other piece of property here for a second. And, uh, you know, which is that if I'm down here in my Patriot Hills base that has tents, you know, 30 tents scattered over a kilometer or so, you know, I'm sure that uh, uh, Mike, who is, you know, one of the guys, one of our friends who kind of runs this space. I know Mike. If Moriba, if Moriba was going to go set up a tent right in the middle of our 30 tents, it would, you know, those people might say, dude, come on, like, you know, scoot over at least to the perimeter of, the, of our little of our village just to keep our separation going nicely. But it's also possible Mike would like to say, hey, I don't want to just buy one kilometer, but I occasionally use all the way up to 10 kilometers around to store fuel or drive things or set up porta potties. So, you know, keep out. And, uh, but, it, but it's also quite reasonable that there would be an effective distance after which any squatter could say, look, you know, I've been here for 20 years. You've not been using that area that is over the, over the river and through the woods out of sight, out of mind. I've been there. And so too bad for you guys, Patriot Hills. This is now my zone. I've been building my encampment over here. And so I actually think, I think there really are going to be these interesting test cases that could play out even as close to home as Antarctica. And Richard, if I may, I think you're talking about two kinds of rights, private ownership rights on the one hand and use rights on the other. And use rights do not convey ownership. Yeah. Yeah, that's the now, whole appropriation. In, 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 in the Arctic where I work, Greenland, there's no private property. People have use rights. Not right, only. and I Fair think that's enough. definitely what's going on with Patriot Hills. I mean, you still have to get permits from Chile and Argentina and, you know, whoever else is claiming that sector to, to do scientific work there. So that's how they sort of kind of continue to say, you know, we're going to tolerate you. But it is, it goes to that whole non-appropriation. You can... You can occupy, you can maybe even do extraction like as you in the deep sea bed, but that doesn't convey uh, ownership rights. And so, you know, is the moon different from these regimes on Earth? And I think that's, you know, um, I think that's the big question here, right? Well, you can, you can pull analogies from the law of the sea. I helped Mike win a precedent over access to the Titanic. The company that has the right to salvage the Titanic does not have the right to exclude you from going there. You, they have the right to salvage, which is governed by a court, and they have to maintain a constant presence over the wreck site. And the word constant is in quotes. Uh, it, it's now looking at 12 years since they've been there. Um, and then I was there in July. But you can, it, it's a stretch. It's it's really a stretch. If you use it, you can you can have a safety zone. You can have sort of the right to not be interfered with, but it doesn't give you ownership and it doesn't give you the right to exclude others, especially if, for instance, in the event of an emergency or in Mike's case, if you bring beer, then he'll let you stay. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the kind of thing where there will be testing done of, of people's rights and the, the rights that they claim. 
Richard's claimed various rights and he's got a lawyer telling him that he has them and some other lawyer is going to come along on behalf of somebody else that wants to contest those rights and, and, you know, squabble about, but doesn't mean they're right. It's, it's a, it's, it's an interesting conundrum and it will continue to be. So Charles, how many more questions do we have? Are we, are we rolling through here? I think we need to schedule our next um, Explorers in the Law meeting. <laughs> Continue in the series, but I'm going to hand it over to the president of our club. Oh, great. Well, first of all, uh, thank you all for allowing me to participate in, in this one. Uh, it was a real pleasure to uh, uh, chat with all of you, and thank you for everybody putting in their questions. Uh, I just have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Uh, one is uh, to be sure to tell people to join us on Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. for Drawn to Nature with Charlene Johnny and Trevor Wallace. Uh, that's part of the Fjall Raven Speaker Series. And of course, our next Monday night lecture, Finding the Clotilda, uh, What Now What Happens? It's an incredible panel on the archaeology of the slave ship called the Clotilda uh, that will be moderated by Jim Delgado. Uh, and by the way, I happen to have been chatting with those guys about what they've been doing there uh, you guys separately, just with on the club business. Uh, it actually sounds like just an, an incredible find, an incredible story, and a lot going on both now and unfolding in the future. So anyway, those are both, I think, things not to be missed. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> unless there's anything else from our panel, I think that will uh, close us out for today. And uh, uh, David, you want to tell them when is the next? Is the next legal uh, one scheduled yet? Yeah, we're looking at um, March, April, uh, not to interfere with what hopefully will be ECAD, but in, in that time frame pre or post, but we, we want to do a program on expedition planning and do's and don'ts, what to look for. We want to do it in, in enough time so that people, we can get people that are going out to the field in, in the Northern Hemisphere in the sum, this summer and, and help them avoid mistakes. Perfect, perfect. We look forward to that too. Well, thank you again, everybody. And from that, uh, from the six or nine or how many time zones we're we've we've uh, we've crossed here today. Uh, thank you all so very much. And thank good you. Night. Good night. Good night, all.